Welcome back. We're joined by our poly panel, Liberal MP Tony Passon and Matt Fisorthwaite from Labor. Thank you for your time. Pleasure, Annalise. Now, big discussion today that's uh, got quite a few people worked up is Bettina Arndt being stripped of her Order of Australia. There's going to be a motion in the Senate today. Matt Fisorthwaite, do you think she needs to be stripped of her order? I do, Annalise. Uh, I read her comments on Twitter on the weekend and I just thought that they were disgusting. Um, this man murdered his wife and two children, uh, three children. Uh, and to incinerate your children in their car whilst they're still locked in their baby seats is just incomprehensible. And comments like that are not becoming of someone <coughs> that is given what is one of the highest orders in this country and recognitions in this country, and I think she should be stripped of the title. Tony Passon. Uh, Annalise, I thought the comments were incredibly ill-advised. They were very poorly timed. Uh, <clears throat> sitting in the House of Representatives yesterday, and I expect Matt shares this view, listening to the Leader of the Opposition and the Prime Minister speak of this tragedy was one of the hardest things I've had to listen to in that mm. place. And to leave that and then later in the afternoon be sitting in my suite and, and uh, reading those comments, um, it literally sucked the oxygen out of my lungs. Does this go to a greater issue? Because she was referencing what a lot of men's rights people say, that <coughs> they can be driven to these, these kind of events because of the family court system. And this is likely to be a feature of the family law inquiry because Pauline Hanson has been a men's right advocate in that space. Oh, look, we need to segregate these two things completely. Um, uh, you know, um, as Matt correctly points out, this was an unspeakable tragedy. Separate to that, there needs to be a discussion about getting the balance right in terms of the operation of the family court. Now, I'm not linking those two things at all. I want to be completely clear about that. Mm. But Pauline Hanson is on the family law inquiry. We had Nick McKim in here this morning saying that she needs to go because of these kind of views. Do you agree? Well, that's not something that I'm going to comment on. You know, the presence of colleagues on committees is a matter for others, not me. How do you feel about that? Should Pauline Hanson be on the family law inquiry? Oh, we've got deep reservations about her being on, on this inquiry. Um, she <coughs> made some comments that I thought were, were quite unnecessary as well about uh, this incident. Um, the, there's no comparison at all uh, in respect of these issues. This man was a murderer. Um, it's a, the most serious crime that you can commit under our laws in this country and there's no way that you can use that as a justification for anything that's going on in terms of policy around the family court. Now, if we move on to one of the more contentious topics between Labor and the Coalition this week, it's been this 2050 target. Why has Labor moved to have this target so early without plan, without the costing? Are you repeating the same mistakes of the election? Well, it's the right thing to do by our economy, by our environment, and more importantly, by, by our kids, Annalise. Uh, the world signed up to a scenario of trying to limit uh, warming globally to two degrees. Now, to reach that, um, the international community said we need to work towards zero net emissions by 2050. The costs of not doing that are catastrophic, particularly for a nation like Australia, where you're going to see the Great Barrier Reef wiped out and all of those jobs that go with it. Uh, farming uh, would be under risk. We've seen what the drought's done and the effects of climate change on the drought and the loss of income for farming communities and farmers. Uh, we've seen the bushfire season be extended. All of these catastrophic events will get worse and worse and worse if we don't move to net zero emissions by 2050. There's actually a net benefit to our economy in that you'll create jobs and new industries, particularly in alternate fuels like um, hydrogen. So we think it's a, a net benefit for the economy and it's something that we should be doing for our kids. Tony Passon, what do you think? Is it the same mistake all over again? Absolutely it is. Look, I held out some hope a fortnight ago when I heard that some very sensible people got together at the Otis restaurant. But I learned now that effectively what they were doing was signing the surrender document. They're giving up on Australian uh, farmers, they're giving up on Australian coal workers, they're giving up on the transport sector. It is complete bumpkin to say you've got a target for 2050, but no way of getting there. I mean, and it's equally rubbish, quite frankly, to say that, oh, well, we can't tell you how we'll get to the 2030 target, but we'll target the 2050 target. Now, Matt might well say, well, hang on a minute, you know, no, next election's not till 2022, but I, I remind your listeners that in 2013, we took to the Australian people a plan step by step to get to us to our um, 2020 target. That's seven years. It would be eight years. So the real question for the Labor Party is, why don't you have a plan to get to 2030? You've got a target for 2050, no plan to get there, but you're asking the Australian people 
to trust them on 2050 with no plan when they aren't prepared to put something on the table for 2030. But, but Tony, your, your South Australian Liberal government <coughs> has a policy of net zero emissions by 2050. That's the party that you're a member of, uh, that your, your, your home state is. That's the same policy that the Labor Party has. How can you be critical of us and not criticise your own party you, for having the same policy? Uh, Matt, I'm a member of the federal South Australian parliamentary team. To suggest that I'm not on occasions critical of the South Australian Liberal Party might misunderstate where so my you don't position support, is. So you don't support the South Australian government's No, no, what I'm saying, Matt, target. is I don't support a 2050 zero emissions target. But that's, you know your, why? that's the Liberal because Party's target. I am backing in farmers in my electorate because, mate, you refer to New Zealand on this as a support, but you don't tell the Australian people, hang on a minute, even an Ardern government in New Zealand has exempted agriculture, and they've done that for good reason. Mate, I'm not going to sign the surrender document um, on my farmers, on the coal workers in Queensland, um, on transport workers. We need a sensible and balanced approach. We have it. Uh, to be honest, your proposal is bumpkin. Well, that's incredible. That's actually breaking news here, Annalise. Uh, Tony what? Passon doesn't support uh, the, the, uh, the South Australian Liberal government's approach to climate change and their target, because that's what all of the states and territories... Australia's doing it already. Every single square kilometre <coughs> of land in this country has signed up to net zero emissions by, by 2050. By 2050. Well, yeah, they have. State all of the states and policy but uh, the Paris and territories agreement, have. The Paris Agreement so, that we as a government have signed up to says that we've got a plan to get there by the second half of the century. Now, that's... For developing 80, countries, it's 2050. That's Australia 80 years, is a that's, developed country. Matt, that's 80 years from now. To say that we'll be using the same technology today as we're using then is to, to say that we're using the same technology today as we were using in 1940. Technology, not taxes, Matt. Tell, uh, Tony Passon writes a good point with the agriculture point. It is exempt in New Zealand, and we have the National Farmers Federation being quoted by both sides, even though their policy is that they want to hopefully be on track to be in a position to try to achieve a 2050 net zero emissions or 2030. Why are you using that as an example of where we can achieve when that's not the plan of anyone in that sector? Well, it is the plan of the Meat and Livestock Association. Um, they've come out and said that they want to achieve net zero emissions by 2030. And what we're saying is that we should set this goal and then work with all of the respective industries and state and territory governments, interest groups and indeed the Australian people to achieve that. So we work together to ensure that there aren't job losses, that uh, industries can continue into the future and thrive around new technology. It's about setting a roadmap and then working consultively with Australian industry uh, and with the Australian people to achieve it. So you can't take this seriously. You can't say we've got a 2050 target uh, and then say we're going to work on how we get there. Um, uh, the uncertainty that that creates, you're bringing this to the Australian people at a time where there is uh, unprecedented headwinds for our uh, economy. We've got, obviously, bushfires. Um, we've obviously got the effects of the drought. We've got the impact of the coronavirus. This is... Um, ill-advised, ill-timed, uh, and with no plan to get there, quite frankly, it's just bumpkin. Well, that's, that's the whole purpose of this, Tony. We're trying to, to, to not use this as a political weapon anymore. The, your you're party trying to run used, to the left and your save, party has save used, yourself on your left flank. No, no, that's your party has do. used climate change as a political weapon to campaign against the Labor Party and the Australian people on this for close to a decade now. And the Australian no. people are sick of it. They want us to that, set a goal that we can work to together on a bipartisan approach with industry, with the Australian people to achieve Matt, it. And that's what we're trying Matt, to do. We're a, holding out an olive branch to you sorry, guys. Mate. Work with us on Matt, this. Matt, this is a misrepresentation of the facts. We have put to the Australian people a plan to get to 2030. We are on track. We went to the Australian people at the last election where many within your movement were suggesting it was the climate change election. We went with an alternative plan and quiet Australians in their droves voted for us. So to suggest that people of Australia are... Uh, baying out for us to kind of move over the divide to your position on this is just not factually There was, a, there was an essential accurate. poll that was published today. 68% of Liberal identified voters support the 2050 um, net zero emissions target. So Liberal voters throughout the country and the rest of Australia I'm sure if they're want asked, us to move towards this. I'm sure if they're asked... And we want to do it in a cooperative manner to take this, this war against climate change and <coughs> science out of it and work together 
in a scientific approach to ensure that we maximise the results for the Australian okay. economy and the people. Well, I don't think we're going to come to an agreement. No, I think we're going to be filling this studio with hot air too, before too long. <laughs> Just finally, if we can move on to Mike Burgess's speech. This is pretty iconic to have head of ASIO give a public speech about um, the focus of his department. In particular, he talked about the rise of right-wing extremism. Mm. We've just had Ed Husick in here saying that he wants an inquiry into the rise of right-wing extremism because it hasn't had the focus it should. Tony Passon, would you support that? I don't, but I think the work of the security agencies needs to be left to the security agencies. I want to be uh, clear. What that speech underlined for me is the need for us as a nation to remain vigilant. Extremism, wherever it's found along the ideological spectrum, is um, the threat. Um, the threat of um, terrorism is at um, unacceptable levels. The threat of foreign espionage is unprecedented. And so we need to back in our agencies. And I don't think uh, an inquiry of the type that um, Ed was speaking of earlier will, will assist in that regard. Let's leave the professionals to get on with doing what they do so well. There are a lot of social causes, things like that, to right-wing extremism, though. Matt Thistlethwaite, would you support an inquiry? I think Ed's on the money here. Uh, for Mike Burgess to specifically say that there's an issue with right-wing extremists in his first um, speech, major speech, about uh, an update to the Australian people on these issues, I think was quite significant. And it's not just Australia, um, it's other countries throughout the world, Western democracies that are facing this challenge with right-wing extremists as well. And let's face it, in our region, in our backyard, we had one of the largest massacres by a right-wing extremist in New Zealand. It's a serious threat and it's something that we need to ensure that our security and intelligence agencies are across. Would you support an inquiry if it wasn't PJCIS, if it was in another form? Oh, look, I haven't turned my mind to it, obviously. It's, um, this call has just recently been made. But my, my first inclination in this space is always back the agencies. Well, Tony Pass and Math Thistlefate, thank you for your time. Thanks, Annalise. Thanks, Annalise.